welcome to Empowered Heart to Heart, where you'll hear messages of hope, conversations that heal, and interviews that empower. Well, hey, this is Dr. Rhonda Simmons, and I am so excited to be with you one more time for another edition of Empowered Heart to Heart. I am so glad that you're here, and it it is going to be a great episode today here on the podcast and YouTube channel. It's going to be wonderful. Of course, I have a special guest as always, and I keep saying it because it keeps being true. I have met some of the best people this side of heaven uh, on my show from all over the globe, and today is no exception. So before we even start this interview, I want you to make sure that you like, comment, and share this video if you're watching it on our YouTube channel um, or listening on our podcast. Make sure that you're letting your friends know what you're watching and listening to so that they can enjoy it as well. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit the notification button, too, so that you'll be notified every single time I upload a new video. Make sure that you are connecting with us uh, on social media, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. We can be found there at T-S-E-F-I-O-R-G. Yes, I know that's a mouthful, but it's the acronym for the Simmons Empowerment Foundation Incorporated. So you want to make sure you're connecting with us because we've got lots of great things happening. And so uh, I am so excited because we have a very special guest today um, who is not only a friend of mine, but she is making a huge impact in her space. Uh, Dr. Pascal Edward. Uh, and she has a whole lot of initials behind her name, um, but she is the founder and principal consultant for Health Equity Innovations, LLC, uh, which is a boutique public health consulting firm dedicated to collaborating with corporate, nonprofit, community, and faith-based organizations to provide people-centered, culturally informed, and equity-driven health programming educational resources, and capacity building services, all in an effort to advance health equity among historically marginalized populations. I said all that to say that Dr. Pascal is a phenomenal, phenomenal professional who has a deep heart and passion for um, helping and empowering women of color specifically within our African-American community so that they can make a profound impact in the public health space. And so I am so excited to uh, bring Dr. Pascal onto the stage. Hello, Dr. Pascal. How are you? I am well. How are you, Dr. Rhonda? (laughs) I am great. I'm so glad we could make this happen today. You know, you are just just hitting your space with both feet. I, I love what you're doing and I love your your focus. I love your focus. What what made you start your LLC? Um, thank you for the compliment and thank you for having me on your show. Um, so with Health Equity Innovations, um, I'd like to tell the story of how like literally this organization, although it's a year, about a year and a couple of months old, it actually was birthed about like seven years ago. <laughs> Like the seed was planted, I should say, seven years ago. Um, But because um, I felt like I needed to get more education and more schooling and everything, um, it didn't, I didn't actually establish or incorporate health equity innovations until last year after I got my, um, last year or the year before, 2022. No, last year, I'm sorry. Um, when I um, finally made Health Equity Innovations an incorporated organization in Florida. Um, but essentially, the the reason behind HEI is that I was working at a local health department in Florida at the time, um, and I felt like things could be done in a better way as far as it 
relate as far as it went to like addressing health inequities and disparities among among communities of color. And what I mean by like done in a better way is that how we're engaging with the community and incorporating the community in like research or um, accessing or um, getting the data from the community members or empowering community members to have those skill sets to be in the front lines, although you're not like an expert in public health, you're an expert in your lived experiences, right? So how do we get community members involved in the public health practice when it comes to collecting data, analyzing data and doing research? Um, and so with health equity innovations, um, this organization really specifically, as you um, mentioned earlier, focuses on working with community-based organizations and faith-based organizations that are specifically focused on improving the health and well-being of historically marginalized populations. Because when you look at like, especially nonprofit organizations, they have low resources and don't have like the capacity building assets, if you will, to do the work that they're doing. And when you look at, when you specifically look at nonprofit organizations of color, you see more of a deficit when it comes to the resources and the capacity building um, assets that they have to do the work that they need to do, which is often important um, work that meets the needs of community members. So yeah, that's, that's how um, health equity innovations came to life. Wow, that's amazing. Well, I appreciate the difference that you're already making uh, amongst the health professionals um, in your field. And so as you as you started out with your extensive career advancing health equity, um, have you ever experienced imposter syndrome? And if so, how did you recognize and confront it? I think all the time, like till this day, I think like with imposter syndrome, it's something that you're constantly um, progressing in and, evol and evolving in how you deal with imposter syndrome, right? And so like with some of the work that I've been doing um, in researching, I've been looking at how, um, like just the different types of imposter syndromes that are out there, right? Some people don't know this, right? The ones that we're most familiar with are perfectionism, right? Which is, you know, a type of imposter syndrome that I suffer from. But there's like perfectionism, the expert, right? Where you feel like an imposter if you don't know everything that you need to know for a particular um, subject. And I think I might have a little bit of that, the expert, where like, if I feel like I don't know enough, I'll go and research and research and research until I know enough and I feel like I can speak about a particular topic um, and feel competent in how I'm speaking about that particular topic. But there's also the natural genius, right? Where you might feel like you're a fraud simply because you don't believe that you're naturally intelligent or competent enough in a particular area or subject, right? Then there's the soloist. That I have. I'm definitely the soloist. <laughs> Um, and the soloist feels like they're an imposter if they have to like ask for help. Um, sorry, ask for help to reach a certain level um, of status or just like asking for help for doing like your regular day to day work. Um, within your respective place of business. And I know that's something that I suffer from. I do not like asking for help. Like if I ask for help, you know, like I'm on my last leg and I'm just like, I need this or like the whole thing is just gonna break down. Um, but there's also the superhero, right? Um, and for black women specifically, we can talk about the black woman, um, superwoman, the black superwoman complex, right? Where we all, we're doing everything that there needs to be done. Um, to reach like the highest level of achievement or success or just taking it all on like within like the dis different roles um, that you have being a mom, a daughter, a sister, a wife, everything, right? And being everything to everyone too. So like those are like the five different types of imposter syndrome. But to answer your question, yes, I definitely do suffer from imposter syndrome. I I would like to think like majority of um, women of color, Black women specifically, suffer from some form of um, imposter syndrome. Um, and I think for me, how do I recognize it? Um, I think for me, it's like a day-to-day -day thing as far as like recognizing the imposter syndrome. Like for example, where I'm doubting myself and my capabilities, right? That's a form of imposter syndrome. Like, so for example, 
with starting my business, right? I knew I wanted to start this business like a long time ago, seven years ago. But again, because of imposter syndrome, I felt like I didn't know enough. I didn't have enough, right? In order for me to start this business. And now like I'm in year two, of health equity innovations, you know, here I am. And it's just like, you, you you always had enough, right? But you had to internally um, affirm yourself that you had enough. And I think for me, that happened after I graduated with my um, doctorate degree, right? And I told myself, I'm going to take six months off just to rest, right? And after those six months, um, I started building health equity innovations. And for me, what was like a constant reminder, like I can do this um, and help push me up the hill was the constant reminder, like I got through the dissertation, right? And the dissertation, you're producing something that no one has produced before. Like you're doing this from scratch. The same thing with the business. I'm building the business from scratch, right? So I, I like to think as far as like for me personally, how I um, try to get myself to move from point A to point B and not be um, paralyzed by my imposter syndrome. I like to think about it like from moving from glory to glory and faith to faith, right? Like I know God got me through this phase, right? He'll get me through this, this next phase. Like the previous phase was just like preparation to get me to point B, C, D, and E or whatever. So I think that's um, one of the, like, I guess how I reaffirm myself whenever I begin to doubt myself when it comes to um, whatever task or responsibility that um, has been handed to me. Wow, that's that's great. That is great. So within your training programs, Dr. Pascal, um, considering your role in training the next generation of public health professionals, um, how do you address the topic of imposter syndrome with those that you're training? So, you know, with the training program that you're talking about, um, the Black Women in Public Health Connect Collective, right? So this is a program that um, literally just launched yesterday that I've been building since for about three months, the entire summer, right? Um, and one of the things that I found is about more a majority of the women. So I surveyed about 130 um, women, Black women in public health. And I believe about 60 to 70 percent of them all responded, yes, that they suffer from um, imposter syndrome, either occasionally or frequently, right? And so with um, this training program that, you know, I'm still building up, one of the things that I incorporate when I'm mentoring, and I'll, I'll speak to mentoring young um, women or women that I've come in contact with as far as like how to address um how to address um, imposter syndrome is just is constantly reaffirm, reaffirming them, right? And then what I mean by reaffirm, reaffirming them is, you know, making sure or having them look back, like look back in their lives where there's like a difficult task that might be similar to the task that they're experiencing, that they're um you know, dealing with right now or the situation that they're dealing with right now and reminding them, hey, like you got through that particular difficult experience or that time where you doubted yourself when you when you had all the things that you needed, but you didn't you just logically, psychologically it didn't click for you, right? But you got through it, right? This too shall pass. But here you are at this crossroads again where you're dealing with imposter syndrome. So think about what made you succeed in the past and get over that stagnation or that paralyzation that comes with um with um feeling like you're a fraud, right? And use that to get you through this particular hump in life that you're dealing with. So it's really like for me re reaffirming them and and really coaching them in a sense, right? So yes, I'm reaffirming them, but yes, coaching them too to like to identify those tool those tools within their tools toolbox to help them address um imposter syndrome on their own too because I'm not always going to be there, right? So you have to make sure you have those tools in your toolbox in order to get through that imposter syndrome or feeling like you're a fraud hump. It's almost like you're um, recommending that uh, people have keep a, a personal resume, so to speak, of the things that they've accomplished and um, their, their successes and their wins so that in those moments of, oh my goodness, I can't do this, you know, they can go back and look and see what exactly. they've done. Wow. Yeah. So and we call that a brag book. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. 
So definitely a brag, but, um, and I learned this um, when, back in 2019, when I um, took like some career coaching, right, with Dr. Um, Miss Monica Simmons, right? Um, and she's also in the public health field. And she, you know, encouraged all of us who were taking her, her career, who were taking her her career coaching course to have a brag book where you're writing all your accomplishments and you can always go back. And this and she was doing this with us when, when it came to resume writing, right? So you can always go back and um, highlight your accomplishments in your resume and your cover letters, right? And so ever since then, that has stuck with me is like, yes, log all your successes. And, and that's something too, we is, um, I'll speak specifically for Black women, but, you know, other women of color might all also experiencing experiences. We don't celebrate our small wins, right? But with you writing down and journaling your small wins, you're kind of like forced. It, it becomes like a habit to celebrate, like even if it's not, not just celebrating, but acknowledging those small wins that you've experienced throughout your career or like whatever it is that you're involved in. And then going back to those as constant reminders as to, yes, I did this. I can do that. I can do this thing that I'm facing now. Absolutely. So Dr. Pascal, um, I know you work within the public health space um, and that's exciting. I'm glad to see that uh, we have some successful um, doctors in that space who um, are people of color and we're, we're represented. But why do you think um, newcomers to the field, especially if they are a woman of color, feel so intimidated? What is the, what is the inequity issue there in, in, public, in public health administration? So when you say inequity, are you talking about like the inequity as far as intimidation or those who are experiencing like health disparities? Um, I think intimidation first. Okay. Um, I think from what I, well, I can, and I can speak to my experiences too, right? The lack of representation within those spaces, right? So public health is predominantly a white profession or a white industry where um, last I looked up, According to the um, the Beaumont Foundation's Public Health Wind Survey, about fifty yeah fifty four percent of professionals within public health identified as white women, right? But what we're seeing too, although there's like an increase in diversity um, within the public health field, what we see is that within the senior level positions, there's still a disparate number of people of color or black women in those senior level positions where I, I believe it's like 66% of senior level positions within public health are made up by, of white and the individuals, right? And so because of that lack of representation, right, I think that contributes to, um, and, and let me know if I'm answering your question because I feel like I'm all over the place, um, but I feel like that contributes to feelings of like whether or not I belong, right? Um, in these certain public health spaces. Like for example, in I started, my first job in public health um, was in 2013 um, with the health department in Sarasota County. And I, I felt like literally within my department, no, literally within my department, I was the only black girl, the only black girl. <laughs> Wow. Yes, the only black girl. I wasn't the only um, person of color because there was like a... Um, Indian um, woman um, and a Hispanic woman too within my department or within like the area I was sitting, but I was literally the only black girl. And so with that, like, it was just like, A, do you belong or do I have what it takes? And because, and, and sometimes like, I felt like people would question whether or not I do belong, whether or not I have the education and the status or the qualifications to be in this role. Um, that I'm in. And because of that, I found myself overcompensating, right? Which also gets back to um, imposter syndrome, right? With overcompensating, like making sure like I'm dotting every I and crossing every T, there's that perfectionism, right? Perfectionism. And then always over preparing, right? Making sure <laughs> that like, if I'm saying something, I'm like rehearsing something, like rehearsing my presentations in my head, like I'm rehearsing the presentations the night before. And that's something I still do today, right? That perfectionism and over compensation and over preparation. But I really do think like the lack of representation 
of um, Black women and women of color in mid-level or senior level positions within public health is one of the reasons why we have like a large percentage of um, women of color who suffer from um, imposter syndrome. Not to say, I do want to be clear and say, um, not to say that white women don't suffer from imposter syndrome, but specifically within public health, since it's a predominantly white um, female based um, industry. Um, these are some of the reasons why Black women um, experience imposter syndrome. Wow. Let me tell you, uh, Dr. Pascal, I have experienced where everything was fine in my world until I decided to move up on the ladder. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I, I there was there's so many cliches that come to mind right now that I'm just not going to share. But um it was like everything broke loose simply because I decided that where I was was no longer serving me mm -hmm. and that I had grown to another level and it was time to move up. Do you find that that same generalized scenario is true within public health, that as long as you stay wherever you come in, you're OK. But when you decide to take on uh, management or leadership roles, then it's it's like there's a target on your back. Yes. <laughs> Um, yes, I can definitely a relate and I, I have witnessed this. Um, uh, yeah, I've witnessed this um, happen in certain um, public health spaces, right? Um, but I think too, what, what we're seeing is instead of leaving, <laughs> um, and I don't know the exact like numbers and the data to speak to, but what I am seeing though, is that a lot of black women within public health are deciding to start their own consulting companies, right? And becoming, and they're working full time. They're, they're trying to get to the point where they can leave um, their jobs because of the microaggressions or the mistreatment that they may experience as they seek to break the glass ceiling, if you will, right? Um, and, and it's, um, Repeat the question again, just to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm answering it. <laughs> well, I believe my question was, do you find the same generalized scenario within public health as I did in other arenas where as long as I stayed put, everything mm -hmm. was fine. But yeah. when I decided to move up, then uh, there seemed to be so much of a problem all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah, because you're somewhat the head, you know what, in charge, right? Um, and where does that happen? There seems to be like this unwritten rule where Black women or Black people can't be the head person in charge of an organization. And because of that, um, we experience, you know, these microaggressions um, within these workplaces. So yes, there is that trend in public health. Um, and one of the things that we see is that like Black women in, um, and it's not all, um, but I will say there is like a high percentage um, of individuals or Black women or Black men too who experience this as they seek to move up the career ladder, um, but you're not provided as much support as others, right, who might be white adjacent um, appearing. You're not provided as much support or resources. And because of that, you're working twice as hard in order to ensure that you're successful in your role, in your department is successful um, in your role. And then at the, at the end of the day, it's like you question, is it worth it? Because as you're doing all of this and overcompensating, not because you don't belong, but because someone else has their own internal um, implicit and explicit biases, right? You're overcompensating for how they view you, but yet it's chipping at who you are at your core, right? And there's only so much that you can chip away <laughs> at when it comes to who you authentically are, which again leads to 
you questioning whether or not a this is worth it and then b should i stay um and so you have because of that some black women who decide to leave altogether and start their own um entrepreneurship journey where they don't have to deal with the, those mistreatments or you have those who simply leave and go to another job um where they hope the grass is greener on the other side yes <laughs> yes i hear you you know as, as we wrap up this um interview one of the things that i i heard you talk about um several times is that um a lot of uh, african-american women within the public health administration field are deciding to start their own consulting firms um I, I can't help but think about the scripture where Joseph told his brothers toward, toward the end of his life, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And how mm. sometimes the, the negativism and the pressures and the, the, the nonsense and the shenanigans push us into who we were destined to be anyway, yeah. you know, because sometimes you may not have even thought about starting a consulting firm, um, until they just kept pushing you and they kept making it obvious they don't want you here. Okay, well, then now I'm your competition. <laughs> you you know? just spoke word to me and to me. And girl, we, we can talk about this offline. <laughs> but yes, that, that is the case. Like sometimes we're pushed out. I, I believe in what you just said 100%. Sometimes you're pushed out um, so that way you can authentically operate. Um, is who you were meant to be and not necessarily have to deal with the shenanigans of um, the workplace. <laughs> yes, yes, because, you know, it, it's, it, and, and the thing about it is, Dr. Pascal, it's just like, once you're out, you're like, oh. It's a whole it's new like world. The, yes, yes, and you realize that this is what you were meant to do after yeah. all. I'm not knocking employment and working for, for other people and other organizations. Um, but as they used to say way back in the day, God bless the child that's got his own, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, it's, it's a whole different mindset when, um, you get to, um, call the shots and, and not just make a salary, but you're the one making the profits, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, making a difference. And so um, I am excited to um, have shared this this moment with you. Um, for those of you that may be watching on our YouTube channel, if you're looking for how to reach out to Dr. Pascal Edward, Edward um, her uh, website is scrolling across the bottom of the screen. I'll put it in the description of the podcast episode, because if you're in the public health administration space, you need to connect with Dr. Pascal so that you can get to your next level. Um, if you're satisfied with where you are, congratulations, that's wonderful. Um, I'm happy for you. We should be content in the things that we have, um, but we should not use that Bible verse to think that God does not want us to have more and to do more and to accomplish more. Um, and so um, I encourage you reach out to Dr. Pascal because she's on to something great. She is um, doing something uniquely different um, in her field amongst uh, women of color. And I think it's going to be fantastic. You need to get on board. Dr. Pascal, do you have any uh, last words you wanna share with us? Um, yeah, just to everyone, you know, who's listening, who might struggle with imposter syndrome, I just want to share a couple of words of encouragement that my dissertation coach, Dr. Marvette Lacey, um, really drilled into us, which is you are enough, you know enough, and you have enough, right? Just constantly remind yourself of that. Um, so that way you you don't stay paralyzed and, you know, believing or thinking that you're a fraud. But yes, Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rhonda, for having me here. Absolutely. I'm glad that you were able to join us today. And if you'll just hang out just for a moment, I'll wrap up the show and I'll get right back to you. Okay. 
I told you, yes, I did. I told you, I don't know if you were listening, but I told you that I have met some of the best people this side of heaven. And today's guest, Dr. Pascal Edward, uh, is no exception. And so we don't have to suffer with imposter syndrome. We have to know who we are. We have to believe in the abilities that, that God has given us and that he has allowed us to pursue and to build up. We've gotten our education. We don't have to, to dumb down our intelligence for anybody. We are who we are. And, you know, some people uh, see that as a form of pride. I'm not being prideful at all. It's just, I am who I am by the grace of God. And I believe that's a scripture. The apostle Paul said that. And so, uh, God needs people in every walk of life, in every aspect of life, and we need to show forth the goodness of God. We need to show that um, God can take us, you know, from the the rear to the head. He can take us from being low man or woman on the totem pole to being in charge, not not through any goodness of our own, but because of His grace and His mercy. And through our hard work, because the Bible says faith without works is dead, being alone. So when we say that we belong here, it's not because we didn't pay our dues. Oh, yes, we paid with interest. We paid to get here. And so when you walk into a room, own it. Own it. And if you're listening to the podcast, you just missed my head roll. Let me tell you, own it. You are who you are by the grace of God. And don't let anyone take that away from you. I encourage you, do what Dr. Pascal said and keep a brag book. That that little journal that you jot down all of your accomplishments, all of the things that God has helped you to conquer, to achieve, to do, to create. Those are things that you can speak to. It's a part of your story and it makes you who you are. And so until the next time, be blessed, be encouraged. But most of all, be empowered, and I'll see you on the next edition of Empowered Heart to Heart.